welcome to Harness Your Intuitive Superpowers, where you learn energy secrets that busy professionals need in order to thrive beyond mediocrity and embody extraordinary abundance and success. I'm your host, Dr. Amira Hall, and today I'm super excited to bring to you my guest, Diana Micus. Diana is an author, she's a publisher, she's the host of her podcast, Higher Love with Diana Micus. Her podcast is all about change and about changing how we do love. For a better part of a decade, Diana has been working with women around the world to help them align with their core values and beliefs and to release emotional blockages, to find their own energetic equilibrium, to find self-love, and more importantly, love the life they live. And Diana believes that, you know, this journey of going through breakthroughs and busting up limiting beliefs is the way to free yourself to access that intuitive power within you. I'm super excited to have you join us because Diana shares tips on self-love and how you can harness your intuition to make the best decisions for yourself. Her approach to coaching is holistic. It's multifaceted. And I have to say, with over 30 years of practical experience, Diana is a wealth of information. So help me welcome Diana Micus. So welcome to this space, Diana. Thank you so much, Amira. I am so blessed and honored to be part of this wonderful event that you're hosting and to talk about intuition, breakthroughs, energy work, and how you can apply that in all aspects of your life. And love. And how all, all of that actually secretly behind the scenes is amplifying our intuitive abilities. So tell me, obviously you had a career before you got into life coaching. Tell us about that. That's a long story, but I'll try to make it as short as possible. I've always been intuitive, even as a child, always had this awareness of people, what was going on, that kind of thing. And I also knew that I needed to be married. I needed to have three kids in this life. I knew, I know, I knew that I needed to do it early in my life. So I picked a partner based on everything I knew and experienced up until that point in my early 20s. Got married quickly, had three kids. Boom, 20 years goes by. And you realize, I realized that I was deeply unhappy and I was not in a, the partnership I thought that I, want, I was buying into and that I had attached myself to. So when I started doing my own work, which started back in the 20s, but in a big way, I started to realize that I had some pre-programmed stories around what relationships should look based on what I experienced with my parents, which was very dysfunctional, even though they were married for 60 years. And I just duplicated that. I was unhappy. I decided that he was not willing to do his work. I dove into my work, saw, started to see things clearly. It's like removing the fog because I bought into this idea of what marriage and partnership was like, which is contrary to how I wanted to function. But I bought into it and it took me five years to separate. It was, it was probably the worst case scenario, very painful. Everything fell away. Lost my house, my community, even my parents, not my, my, not my dad, but even my parents weren't supportive of me. And I really had to have a look at what is this energy that is around me? Why is it, why am I starting from dead scratch with three kids in tow by myself? And so what year was that? That was 2012. Okay. And so that was in Canada, right? I, as a fellow yeah. Canadian, I recognize when I divorced, it seems like I didn't have any support either. It was almost like it, you had leprosy or something. They just didn't want to be near you. It's I called it the divorce cooties. Cooties. And then that was going to reflect on them in a way. And I thought it was interesting. I'm curious, what's your birthday? October 10th. Okay. So you're a Libra. Yeah. So being out of balance was really probably incredibly painful. Yeah. Painful, hard, very hard, very difficult. So yeah, it was, that's why I needed to really from scratch, get back, get my balance back, redefine who I was, find that self-love again, because I was married to a narcissist and it was always my fault. And mm. I believed it after a while. 
I believed I was the problem. I was the one who was always the bad person in any argument. How dare I expect respect and courtesy? All the stuff that goes on with narcissists, as we know, it's like a big thing right now. I live and yeah. it was not. I didn't even know what a narcissist was. Well, I didn't use that word back then. He was just an asshole. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting when you're not willing to do your work. As they say, mental illness just gets worse as you age. And that's what was happening. We were going like this. And so my work, it was a blessing. That whole experience was a blessing because I know I would have picked somebody similar to learn the same lesson. And from that, I quit my job because I was working only to pay my legal bill. I quit my job because everything just fell away. And I just, yeah, a little bit of savings. I went, that's it. I got to start over. I got rid of everything, quickly moved my kids into a condo. By this time, they were like in their older teens. So they were fine. And I went to India for a month. Wow. And I that had nothing to do with eat, pray, love, because everyone, because I was doing No, I, did, I never intended on going to India at all. In fact, I was saying, oh, I'm never going to India. I'm going to get sick, as we we're talking about sure. earlier. Yeah. I, it, when, that, when it comes, when the message comes, then there's no doubt. There's nothing standing in your way. So it was very clear I needed to go to India, to this particular ashram, the Osho International Meditation Resort. It was through him that I was going to heal. And I've been back three times. Fantastic. This year is going to be my fourth. And I just went on this journey of self, self-healing self and became a nutritionist, became a, Re- I was always doing Reiki, I was certified to the master level of Reiki and life coaching and just started to work on myself. And with that, working with women who are going through divorce and separation. And here okay. I am. Yeah, it's fantastic. So let's talk about what self-love is, because obviously you had a journey of discovering what self-love was, right? Because I I remember, recall in your opening, you said, I needed to get married. And I found that an interesting word choice. And yeah, we do things, but we, because we're programmed and we think we have to do that to feel, fulfill something. So now you're coming all the way around full circle. And finding out what loving yourself means. Yes. It was a real journey because I'd never experienced what self-love was. I grew up in a family that where my mother showed me she was, they were both children of the war and they both suffered traumas. My mother tried to commit suicide when I was 11 and created an atmosphere of self-criticism and unsafe, an unsafe environment where we were all taught to never speak our truth or reveal how we feel. So it was very, I was trained to keep it close, never say how you feel, never truly admit to any disappointment. So it, so it was unpacking that. And for everybody, self-love is quite unique because we all have this experience of what love is. And that's one of the first steps is defining what is love for you? We use this word love so often everywhere, but everybody's perspective is so unique. So the trick, the the journey to self-love really is unpacking all that programming. What is love to you? What does it mean? We know from the movies and social media, oh, romantic love is this. And but it's not that. It is everything else but that. It is self-compassion, being kind to yourself. It's about putting yourself first. It's about allowing yourself space to make mistakes and yet forgive yourself. Allow yourself to explore and grow and understand that life is all about learning from mistakes. And it's about, it's about really growing up because we come through life from the point of view of our wounded inner child. And I know that's a term that everybody re- uses, but when we are in, and most of us are, I'm, I don't know what the percentage is, because I don't know, but we see the, word, the way the world is functioning. We're all suffering through trauma and reigniting that trauma over and over again until we start to look at it and unpack what that is and understand that it's our wounding that has not been resolved. So the process of self-love is finding what that wounding is and resolving it within ourselves so that we can start to live from a higher vibration, start to live from our true intuition and what our real idea of self-love is. Yeah, I really love that. It's hard to explain. I even with 
my mentoring clients, I try to explain as we release these patterns, these programs that are so hidden from our viewpoint, we've packed them away and archived them in such secure vaults within ourselves that it, it can be shocking to relive some of those experiences. And when we talk about getting to intuition, it's funny, that's the, that is the result of doing the work the work. And the work involves, for me, I like the quickest, fastest route. I don't like to lollygag around and waste time. And especially, I f I'm feeling an urgency with people or with all of us that yeah. this is not a practice life. We've, it's time to wake up. It's time to do the work. Let go of the baggage. That, like in your case, in your family, my family, similar story, and we don't realize how that's been affecting our ability to manifest or to be successful in our careers. And or maybe that is all we focus on. So then we're not allowing ourselves to be in a flow with the other things in life. So it's creating that, I guess, life balance as well as that inner balance that I does it come from the outside in or is it the inside out, Diana? The both. It's really both because our experience in this life with people and relationships really does ignite the inner work. Because if we were just living by ourselves as hermits, then there's no reason. There's no conflict. There's just inner oh, voices. I love it. <laughs> but you need, that's why my work is always about heartbreak. Because we need to get to a point where we are suffering and we are so low in order for us to start working to get. Right. Uh, to, to reach those higher vibrations and to start right. healing. It, yeah. It's sad that we have to get to the point of really feeling the pain and the suffering. Everyone has a different pain monitor for sure. Uh, but, it, but we need to have those experiences. We need to have the heartbreaks. We need to have the arguments. We need to have the, the losing of the job, the losing of the house, the family, the what? How did this happen? I thought I was programmed and I was doing everything right. Oh no, honey, the program yeah. is wrong. And I love what you said about the idea that we have to dig deep back into what that trauma was. That we call trauma. It doesn't have to be a trauma, but it, right. it is. It's it is. That's the word. Big T, little T. It is the trauma that is igniting that that process of healing. And I just want to mention: you don't have to go back into the pain. You have to look at it. Yeah. You have to analyze it. You don't have to go into the trauma. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So what do you think are some of the first signs to watch for when if, trying to find out if we lack love, self-love? Yeah, that's a really great question because there is this thinking out there that, oh, if I treat myself to wine and chips on a Friday night, I'm experiencing self-love. Or if I have a manic petty, then that's self-love. And that's great. That's self-care. But when we, and we know this, we know when we've fallen out of integrity with ourselves because then we start feeling shame, embarrassment, judge, self judgment, all those feelings when they come up, you're out of integrity. I talk about integrity a lot. Self, when we're lacking self love, is what we call self sabotage. It's when you, for example, have been invited to go away on a girls' weekend and you really aren't energetically aligned to the group of women, but you want to be part of that group of women. And you don't want to miss out because it's going to be fun. And you don't want to like miss out. it's going to be fun. <laughs> you think it's going to be fun yeah. Yeah. because it all sounds fun. But when you get there, you realize you've, you have, you know, you've made a mistake and you're out of integrity and that's lack of self-love. You haven't taken care of what you truly wanted in that and moment when you made that decision. And it's listening to your intuition. Exactly. Exactly. That's basically it. It's the same thing. When you're not listening to those inner voice, the inner voice that is clear, not muddled. And when a model doesn't give you anxiety, when it's clear and you're grounded and you feel good in your body, that is your intuition. It's not the self-criticism and beating yourself up because you're not doing something in the way that should be done or whatever the story is in your mind. You know that you're out of integrity when you start feeling that a little bit of anxiety and fear around it. That's not what I'm talking about. It's really that clear voice. And I'm sure, you know, your audience and you talk about intuition a lot. That's the clear. Some people say it's, oh, I'm Jesus is telling me, God is telling me, the universe is telling me. 
whatever. It is your own message that is clearly what you need to be doing in that moment. So that's when you've fallen out of love. Very simple. And it happens in little ways throughout the day. When you decide to do something that just doesn't feel right, you're out of integrity right there. Yeah. And through my years of working with people, one thing that surprises me is how professionals will mask their confidence. And let's say you go out in the world and you're showing, oh, yeah, I can get this done. You do too much, probably take on more than you should. And they might be accomplished, but they're quivering on the inside or they just feel like they aren't enough. Is that like a sign of yeah. lack of self-love? Absolutely. That's, again, another great example of when you've fallen out of integrity. And I talk about there's so many different levels of what you've just said that you need to take into consideration because I do Reiki work and because I'm very in tune with the masculine and feminine. There's we're all we all have masculine and feminine energy within us. But when we are we're living in this world, which is very masculine, we tend to push our feminine aside and be like the mat. We are we have to we put on the cloak of the masculine within our job and in our career, and then we become more aggressive and more competitive and I'm done. <laughs> yeah, and more demanding. And we turn into what we call assholes. You don't have to be an asshole, but I've seen this time and time again. And you lose a sense of yourself. And what is really, the, what the misrepresentation is that the feminine is weak and that the feminine is like not good in the realm of business and commerce and career. And that's a complete fallacy. Yeah, it there was a crock, all right. It is a crock because the feminine is like, and the Harvard Business Review did an amazing special issue on how males and females function in the workplace. And they concluded that women are more collaborative. They're more team oriented. They, uh, they don't need to be the peacock where men do. Men peacock. And also men present, uh, they misrepresent their talents by, 70% of the time. Oh, God. Where, that's so good. Where, whereas, yes, women underrepresent their talents by almost the same percentage. Wow. We downplay ourselves because yeah. we don't want to appear too overly confident or too qualified, or we don't want, we, we go, we're such nurturers and collaborators that we don't want to outshine anybody. I'm saying this in a general way, of course. Yeah, yeah. But this is what this whole issue reveals over and over again. Women are collaborative and men are competitive. They do not bring up their team. They want to be number one. Women bring up their team. They want everybody to buy in. They want everybody to have a voice. And it's astonishing to know that that is the feminine and to realize that is the feminine work. That is what is actually going to propel and ignite everybody in business. It's not as we have seen the masculine. We know what the masculine does in the business world. We've seen it time and time again. We well, need yeah. to be aware of that in our own selves, especially as females. I know you're going to have males on this as well. Right. But as females, understand that pushing down our feminine is not the way to be successful in our career. And so to shine more light on that, I see it as getting into the flow. And that's more of our feminine aspect to it's sort of a mode of operation. I'm reflecting back on my years in corporate and I remember myself, we go into the male world and we match the frequency unknowingly, unconsciously thinking that's what we have to do to be successful. We have to do it like they do it. Well, what happens is we lose that sense of self and we start doing it different, cranking up that get it done and measuring up. And yeah, it's just an energetic shift that is so radically opposing our natural beingness, right? That feminine, which exactly. should be a higher level being in a female body. And then it literally disturbs the whole patterns and the functions. And we have a yeah. situation, a flare out. And uh, yeah, so uh, we get intellectual. Do, would you say that's a overly intellectual? Who's yes. masculine driven? Absolutely. We're in our heads a lot. We're in the mind too much. And we forget about our heart because it is about leading with the heart. It really is. The intuition is it's heart driven, right? And our heart 
energy is what a hundred times more powerful than our mind energy. So we forget about that. And that's where we go wrong. That's where we get sick being a nutritionist. Yeah. Being a nutritionist. Every single one of my clients had thyroid issues. Yep. Guess why they did? Because we shut our voice down all the time. Society shuts it down, but then we comply and then we shut it down ourselves. And the, all of these ways that we shut our feminine down manifest physically. And yep. we need to look at this. Why is it that women are dying of heart attack? Number one killer of women. It's not breast cancer. It's heart disease. Yeah. We're shutting right. down yeah, our stress, but it, we're shutting down our intuition, our heart center, our yeah. heart energy that is our leading force. We shut it down. And then intellectually driving ourselves all the time and with our devices locked in and our mind is so busy multitasking, it just takes us out of that natural centered space and fully expressing self and really coming into alignment with ourselves, knowing, no, that doesn't feel good to me. I'm not going to do that or I don't want to do that. This, I have exactly. To stop. Exactly. So, and it takes yeah, courage. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back to that is being able to listen to that inner voice and what? Watching the signs. I'm trying to get back to this conflict that I think females have in the corporate world and how we start driving ourselves. And even entrepreneurs are driving ourselves and second guessing self and doing what other people say they should be doing in order to get to a certain point. What, how do we get to knowing where self-love is appropriate when we really are on a mission? How do we come to that place of integration? Yeah, that's that. See, that's the number one quandary. And thank you for bringing that up. It all comes back to knowing who you are. What does love mean to you? What does it mean to be an integrity for you? Not the programming, but you. It's about getting grounded and who you are, appreciating what you bring into relationships, to your job, to the world. It's not about getting the validation, which is what you're saying. We're so focused on the rewards, the, the accolades, the, the social, account. the bank account, the money. Oh my God, what? is going on with the money. We're so focused on the money representing who we are and what we can buy, which is the complete opposite of what we should be doing. And that's why we're all sick and suffering and unhappy and depressed and anxious. Because and like sleeping pills can't sleep. Yeah, we're sleeping so strung out. Anti-anxiety yeah. pills, all of the pharmaceuticals just to help us through our day. It comes back to doing that work. Who are we? Coming back to the original who we are, the original person we were when we were little, that we liked ourselves, like we did things. This is about us examining how, what, and dismantling all the programming along the way. So that is true success, is staying in your integrity. And then you can be your own leader. You can have a strong, calm voice, say your truth, and everything flows from that. Yeah, it becomes magical. It becomes living in this flow of mystery and wonder and having that childlike perspective when we yeah. know that we're the creator of this. Yeah, exactly. And when we talk, we're both like, yeah, we are here. Most people, when they hear this, they're like, oh, but that's scary because then I'll be socially rejected, which is our you know, number, number one fear as humans. I will go against the grain. But this is where you have to decide, how do you want to live your life? How do you really, how do you want to be successful? Do you really want to end your life with all the stuff? Or do you want to end your life knowing that you made a difference in the world and that you have so many supportive friends and family around you who love you? And being true like, to you. Being true yeah, to you. And loving yourself. And feeling happy. It's just unfortunate. And we talk about doing this, wanting to do this quickly. It's unfortunate that uh, yeah. if you make the decision not to do this work, it might take you until your last breath to realize that you didn't have to live your life suffering. And that's what we are here to try to avoid. And we want to share with the world, right? 
Because the true success is being in your integrity, is having self-love, is having the courage to say, really need to do it that way like everybody else. I'm going to do it my way because I know that this is my flow and this is how I do things in my integrity. And Yeah. No, I remember yeah. way back when in the 90s, when my dad died, I was going through a divorce and then I was diagnosed with the chronic fatigue syndrome. And the doctors told me to go home and prepare my affairs, death or wheelchair. And they did me a favor because most mm. people spend a lot of time with the medical teams trying to figure out what's wrong when it is heartache. It is emotional overload that was sabotaging me. And so I had to go down the path of acupuncture and meditation and yoga and sit on the beach for an hour a week and do nothing. And all of those very simple things that took me, it was, that was incredibly cathartic. And it was, I had a lot of resistance to doing it, but I was forced to. I don't want people to get to that breaking point. I don't want people to have to lose it all and not know what to do to recreate something different and to who to trust along the path. Who can yeah. get me back to something greater than I thought I was? But when we're in those moments of despair and loss and trauma and just want to take a pill and take a, a whole bottle of sleeping pills. <laughs> yeah. But so what tools, how do you, how do we get there, Diana? How do you support people? in stepping out of their own landmines that they created for themselves. Yeah, I have a three-step process. When I was coaching women for years and I developed a program, it was like a 12-week program and they all started with, oh my God, this is so long. And then all of a sudden would end and like, oh my God, this happened so quickly. And they had the amazing shift, like lives were changed physically, mentally, everything like magic happened in those sessions. But I realized I needed to do, I needed to reach more people. So I started writing and that's why I'm the publisher now. And I start writing and in my how to do self-love, I have three steps. It's really num step number one is self-awareness. It's doing the work, just see where the programs are. Where did they come from? How do they impact me? How am I speaking to myself? And then self-acceptance. First thing we do in, in, uh, when we are in heartbreak and when things go wrong is we start punishing ourselves. Yeah. When we start eating badly, we start drinking too much. We start doing things that are really out of character and potentially dangerous to us. So the journey is now self-acceptance. And of course, being female, we are okay. trained yeah. to help. We've been trained from the beginning of our lives to hate our physical being, our physical body. And our physical body, whatever shape it is, the most amazing house that we could live in. And so the process is self-acceptance. It's all the things because I'm a nutritionist. It's like looking at what you're feeding your diet. What are you actually putting in your body? How educating uh, yourself? How is it affecting your mind and how you process emotion? Because what we eat is a direct effect on how we process everything. Mind-body connection is there. No dispute. And really appreciating all of our body, relaxing uh, and not working out as hard as we are because we don't need to. Hello. That's another form of self-punishment. And we talk about physical dysmorphia now. And we all that's been around forever. I was a dancer as a young girl and I saw it everywhere. And it was horrible. Anorexic friends, bulimia, all that stuff was around me. I also suffered from it. And the fitness industry and diet industry is a huge industry feeding off of women's self-loathing of their body. So that's a step that we need to absolutely address because once we just push that away and deprogram that and understand that we are beautiful as we are, regardless, we, whatever we think, whatever we are, intelligent wise is beautiful and perfect. And then the last step is finally self-confidence. Having paved a beautiful foundation, we now can do the work of manifesting and we go through a step of looking at all the life areas. How do we manifest everything we've ever dreamed of? Because it's just there for the taking. And all yeah. we have to do is just eliminate all those programs in that step process. And that, to me, is now the succinct version of how you could do that really quickly. And that's what I teach. I love that. Now, one of the words that comes up that in my work is chakras. 
So how do you work with the chakras? How, do, how does that come into play? And maybe tell us what your interpretation of chakras are. Chakras are metaphysical energy centers that represent the health and the balance of our endocrine system. And that's the real essence of what they are. On a metaphysical level, on a spiritual level, they can mean other things. But I don't go into the emotion of the chakra. I really use them as a diagnostic tool. And we know that, say, for example, let's say an unbalanced throat chakra, for example, can be in deficiency or it could be in excess. So a deficiency is somebody who really does shut their voice down, is meek, literally speaks in a quiet tone, will, all, will always decide never to speak up. Whereas in excess, when the chakra is now excessively open, you're going to have verbal diarrhea, somebody who <laughs> interrupts, who needs to always be the one, the center of attention, who needs to have the last word. That's excess. So our characteristics around the health of our chakras are, can be observed just by the way we behave. It's like a behavioral, like I combine everything, neurophysics all of everything, behavioral science. And so then I can address it from that point of view, from a psychological point of view. What does that mean to you? Why do you feel you need to be the, have the last word? And then we dive deep into how was your childhood? Mm-hmm. Were you the last child in a litter of six that, ne- that was ignored? Were you abandoned by your mother emotionally? We get into all of those stories and then we find out what is the story you've been telling yourself? What did you make from that? What is your rule of life? Because with our stories around childhood, as we make up rules for life, like I will never marry somebody who doesn't have a particular job. I will never, I will never, I remember hearing this, I will never take public transit because people who take public transit are a low life. That's not my opinion. That was a client. And it was like, we make up these rules for ourselves that shut us off from the potential of life. And when we deal with it from the chakra point of view, then they can see the different perspective. Then we balance it. Of course, we do exercises. We do various things that they can do on their own. I'm empowering. I'm not the practitioner anymore. I want people to be able to heal themselves with this knowledge. And then things calm down. There is no need to like, interrupt or there is now a more confident speaking up when we balance. Yeah. And, and, and that's how I do how I do it. Yeah. Identifying what is the true you is part of the journey of coming into alignment to raise the frequency, correct? Exactly. Yeah. All of that. Because with those emotions that keep you in shutting your voice down or keep you in being rude in a sense or interrupting people in a sense. There is all of that. Those emotions are the lower vibration emotions of abandonment, fear, anxiety, self-loathing. All of those are low vibrational emotions. And we want to bring up your vibration and feel, uh, have a release from those lower vibrations so that you can start manifesting because that's what it's about. It's about vibrating higher. Yeah, for somebody that's just heard that, what does it mean raising your vibration? What does that give you? What's the end result of that? Yeah, the end result is that you're going to align more clearly to your integrity, your intuition, and you're going to be able to manifest the things that you actually want in life. For example, we say this all the time when we're sad, we say we feel low. And then depression is really a hard one. I've never been depressed in my whole life, but recently I tapped into what depression felt like and oh Oh, I've been there and I've struggled with it it's dark and it's nasty it's It's scary it's really like the most painful yeah painful vibration that I've felt that's what we talk about lower vibration so we need to like when we get out of the emotions and we heal ourselves and we find balance then we start functioning better we start like seeing Sorry, I've got these ideas yeah. coming. Yeah. I want to ask you. I'm so Let's excited. Go. Okay, sorry, you got me going, Diana. 
Good. And what you're, about you're my gonna... fifth chakra? Is that just, I, it's not me trying to have the fat last line, but all these. So that, okay, I'm channeling. I've got yeah. all of these inspiring thoughts coming into my head. That's my fifth chakra, right? Fifth and sixth yeah. chakra. And yeah. so I want, I'm so excited to grab all this information from you. So being depressed. So when people take antidepressants, to mm-hmm. what? Feel good. And that's mm-hmm. a false sense of feeling good. And it's not raising your vibration. It's just tricking the brain and the nervous system. So do you yeah. think about that as a nutritionist? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I don't take pharmaceuticals. I've tried them because I wanted to know what this path was. I want to, I'm always, I'm an, I'm an explorer in life. So I'm going to try things. Because I want to know what people are experiencing. And pharmaceuticals are, are only there to keep us in our suffering. I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. We have the greatest pharmaceutical laboratory in our mind, in our body. We are the pharmaceutical. We, we are big pharma. We have this. We just need to understand how to use it and how we can pull ourselves out of the cortisol-induced anxiety, long-term kind of effects. We can do that on our own. We don't need to start taking like a Prozac or something that gives us, uh, it triggers our serotonin, our uptake of serotonin uh, in an artificial way. So you're forcing the chemicals in your body to work like in a way that is unnatural and not necessary and ineffective. So there is a sense of it actually just numbs you You don't ever come out of depression if you're taking pharmaceuticals because you can never, ever raise your vibration. You can never, you can never feel good because they're meant to keep you level, which is also very unnatural. We are always doing this all day long, but we have the power to do this rather than this. And And pharmaceuticals just can't do it for us. And it's problematic because then you're not living your purpose. You're not fulfilling your destiny. You're not manifesting what you really want. And so yeah. it's completely opposite. And it really dumbs you down and numbs you out. And so you're yes. not involved with, let's say, some human rights project or some charity or giving back and feeling alive. And the whole point of being here, what the hell are we here for? Except to, we're here to live. We have a purpose. Yeah, yeah exactly. And those pies that we are artificially trying to get again from farm or drugs or whatever. Or a couple uh, glasses of wine every night. Or a couple of glasses of wine. That is something you can do simply by meditating or going yeah. for a walk in nature. Oh my God, it's so simple for us to be able to feel those things. But yeah. we've been brainwashed into thinking we need to do it artificially with substances. And that's the tragedy. And that's what we need to start working on for ourselves if we truly want to live our best life in all realms of life. So that brings us to a great place of what are some of the tools that you would recommend? And I think you have a free gift that you've got for people. Yeah, it is. It is a copy of my new book. And my new book is practical, by the way. And it's very, I'm giving you the tools in the book. I am not I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying, I'm not talking about the velocity, but I bring in everything. I bring in science. I bring in behavioral science, neuroscience. I bring in energy practices because it's important to understand that all these things work together because, though, because you know, what we considered woo-woo is actually how we existed before science even came into our, our you know, science. awareness. It's the ancient it is the, it. yeah. It's the original science, right? It's not the North American science. We've been trained to think that is the true way. We know already. We know. We already have an inner knowing. So I'm bringing in all of those, all of that, all those principles, plus I give you tools. So for example, some of the tools are, oh gosh, where do I start? I focus on the chakras because they're such an elegant system to refer to. And so, for example, let's go back to the throat again, because it is one of the things that we deal with. In order to break up that energy, there's all kinds of ways. Everything holds a vibration. So the throat chakra is associated with the color blue and azure blue. 
So if we wear a blue scarf or wear a blue turquoise pendant, or if we meditate, if we just think of blue existing here and we say the mantra, and do it in the way we know we have heard the ancient gurus or whatever say the mantra, oh, but we have these vibrations, separate vibrations for each one of the seven chakras. So the throat is, so we just do, and I recommend you start with 10, but go up to 108 times. Okay. And that is a beautiful way to balance quickly your throat chakra. That's it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Oh my gosh, there is just so much to digest in what we've just unpacked today and the world of wisdom that you have to share. So I think it's so fantastic that you're sharing that beautiful gift. And I can't wait to dive into it myself. And I encourage everybody to go right now and click the link and get Diana's free gift to you. It will be transformative. So we got to close things up, Diana. I could talk to you forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> it's been so wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your love, your insights, and your experiences with us today. I'm truly grateful. Thank you so much, Amira, for in, again, inviting me on this wonderful project that you have going into. Yes, to allow us to have these conversations and help everybody heal and raise their vibration and live a more successful life. And all realm. So thank you. I'm truly blessed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And for everybody out there, I'll see you on our next episode. Thank you for joining.